Hello. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, for the longest time, I've been thinking about writing my war memoirs. But even after 30 years, I feel like it's still so fresh, the experience, that even though I have occasionally jotted down my memories and my experiences, I have never been able to really compose it. And maybe I'm not really ready for it yet. But I've been thinking lately, you know, as you grow older, you think about your life and some really, really important moments in your life. And the other day I started thinking that, you know, had I died in 1988 in Karakoram Mountains, I would have never been able to, of course, do whatever I've done since then. But also that I owe my life in so many ways to people who literally saved my life. And so let's give you a little bit of a background information. In 1988, I was deployed in the northern mountains of Pakistan at a place called Siachin Glacier, where a limited conflict was going on between Pakistan and India. And it was a war, but the only difference probably was that both sides were not using their air force and they had not declared it a war. So, but it was a conflict zone and by the time I was deployed there, it had already entered a stalemate. The Indians were on, deployed on their posts. We were deployed on our posts. And most of the times what the battlefield activity involved was they bombing us, we bombing them, you know, stupid as it sounds now. And, you know, exchange of gunfire. And sometimes occasionally both sides was, would, would plan a small operation, but nothing much happened in terms of actual face-to-face -face combat. But of course, like having been deployed there, I mean, you, most of us were, you know, 18,000 feet above sea level. My post was 19,600 feet above sea level. So you were not just fighting the so-called enemy and each other, you were also fighting the elements and your bodies were constantly under that strain as well. And today I thought I would take a few moments to thank at least two people who literally saved my life. One of them was Havaldar Yunus. Havaldar is uh, equivalent to the sergeant's rank in United States or any other European army. And the other was Sipoi, the private soldier, uh, Kasim. Now, Yunus was a cross-country runner. He was about 5'4", blue-eyed, kind of a taciturn person, but had a wonderful sense of humor. He could make you laugh in the worst kind of situations. So one night, I think it was May of 1988, when I was given a mission to take reinforcement to a post above us, which was under attack. And uh, we didn't know what exactly was going on because the post was out of contact. And my job was to take medical supplies, as many as we could carry, and of course, ammunition. And then and um, kind of undeclared job was to try to take back the post if we had lost it. So about eight of us left from our camp. And it was a completely uphill climb and we were required to, in terms of elevation, we were required to move from, let's say, gain 2,000 feet in one go from where we were to the post. And that in the mountains, if you have climbed a mountain, you already know that's a really a perilous journey in itself. But my troops always did that. Every second day, they replenished the posts. And all of them were from the northern areas. They were the native people of the mountains. And technically, they had a different lung structure and they were tough as nails. Well, I was a smoker. I was from the plains, you know. And even though I was young, I was 22, my fitness standards didn't compare with those of my troops. They were way ahead of me. So we started with our individual loads, our rucksacks, and I pushed myself a little in the beginning. 
and just when we reached this one spot there was about this spot of about 400 feet of a climb which was exposed and uh, you know the Indians had fixed lines there. A fixed line is when you lay a weapon and tie it down and fix it in a place so that you don't even have to aim, you just shoot and it hits the target area. So they had machine guns fixed line there. So when we reached there, I realized I was completely out of breath. And beyond 18,000 feet, if you lose your breath, that means your lungs do not catch up. You have to actually sit down and let your lungs catch up because there isn't enough oxygen. So I knew that if I walked with, with my troops through that open patch of snow, I would slow them down. And if I slowed them down, you know, I will probably get them killed. So what I did was I sent my troops ahead of me and asked them to wait on the other side or keep going until they reached closer to the post that we were supposed to reach. And I told them I'll just follow at my own pace. But Eunice, my Havaldar, the sergeant, he sent the troops ahead, but he told me, he looked me straight in the eyes, you know, and he said, I'm not gonna leave you here. And I will stay with you and make sure that you cross. And I insisted, I even ordered him to go, but he absolutely refused to do so. So what he did was, I mean, we were literally crawling. So he was covering my body from the left side, from where the bullets were coming, right? And he would crawl with me and he would say, 10 more steps. And I'll take 10 more steps, crawl 10 more steps, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I would stop and he will say, okay, breathe, rest. And then he'll say, 10 more steps. It took us about 40 minutes to cross that little patch of snow. But throughout that perilous journey, he stayed with me, covering me from the side from where the bullets were coming and got me across. And we eventually got to the post and did what we were supposed to do. But now that I look back at it, I realized that if he had left me there, you know, even though he had all the rights to do that, I had ordered him to do that. If he had left me there, I would have never survived that. I mean, I would have died on that mountain. And, you know, later I asked him about it and I asked him, you know, why did you do that? And he was like, you know, I could have lived and left you there, but what kind of a life would have that been? For the rest of my life, I would have to deal with, I left someone to die. And he said, I did not want to be responsible for that. And that stuck with me that here was someone whom I knew, you know, in the battlefield, but we had not grown up together. We were not family who had no reason to sacrifice or put his own life in danger for me. And I could not give him anything. You know, I was just a junior lieutenant, but he did that because as a soldier, as a human being, he realized that that was the right thing to do. So I'll uh, forever be thankful to Eunice for being there, for having stayed with me, for making sure that I crossed that patch of land, that patch of snow, so that today I can tell that story. Now, many years later, you know, when I was an instructor at School of Infantry, Eunice came there to just uh, participate in a course that was required for promotions. And when I saw him in my class, I just pulled him aside and I said, you can just sleep through this course, you know, and you will get an A. Not because you saved my life, but because you fought with a war with me and I know your true potential. It was in no way, you know, a payback or like something that could ever return the favor he did to me. but. At least we got to see each other outside the war zone. The other story was me and uh, my one of my soldiers, Kasim. So when we moved in the mountains, we always moved in pairs. No one went alone. And I think I was being relieved from a post and I was on my way down. And, you know, this is a glacier. 
So if you are moving over the glaciated ice, sometimes it's covered with snow, but the glaciers do develop crevices and those crevices can be deep and you never know where they are or where the new ones have opened. So we were walking on a beaten track and suddenly I felt the snow under my feet give. And before I could say anything, I went down and I felt my feet dangling in the air. But luckily my rucksack got sandwiched between the two parts of the crevice, right? Two walls of the crevice. So I knew I wasn't going down, but I knew I was stuck. And in, in my mind, I was also worried that the soldier who was accompanying me, he's, he was young, you know, 18, and I didn't want him to panic, you know, and I, I, I wasn't worried that he was going to leave me there, but I just didn't want him to panic. So as I'm stuck there, I look up in his eyes and I politely talk to him and I was like, Kasim, uh, I will reach my hands out to you. Now grab my hand, hands, you know, like this, and try to pull me out. And if you feel like I'm pulling you down, then, you know, let go. I don't want you to follow me into the crevice. And, you know, there was a smile on his face, and he's like, in his own language, he's like, what the hell are you talking about? And he grabbed me from my rucksack and pulled me out and threw me on the side. And he said, what do you mean, let you go? And we were both laughing after that. But I realized, you know, in those few moments, if Qasim had just panicked, right, uh, or if the rucksack had not caught, I could have been like all the way down 200 feet in a crevice. So I would like to take today also to thank Qasim and why am I telling this story? I'm telling this story because occasionally I've shared it with friends and family and they find it inspiring. I find it inspiring on a different level now that I teach humanities, now that I teach young people. I find it inspiring because at a place where our physical abilities and our emotional and psychological abilities were being tested to a limit, where survival was the leading, you know, instinctual desire for most of us. These people that I talked about, Avaldar Yunus and Sipai Qasim, defied our basic ideas about human, you know, selfishness that we keep talking about and, and proved to me that under the worst kind of circumstances, human beings, can be kind, can be generous, can be caring, can be helpful. So what I learned from those two instances and from those two people after I came back from that war was to rethink my whole life, right? My approach to it. It took me a while to figure it out, but it started me thinking if I have survived this, if people have helped me live, I owe it to them. And I owe it to myself to live a different life, to live a meaningful life. Now, has that been successful or not? It's not for me to judge, but the only thing I can say and share is that, you know, I've been trying to live a decent, humane life. And maybe I can attribute it to my own thought processes and all, but I think deep down I know it was because of Avaldar Yunus and Sipai Qasim and so many others who impacted my life during that war that I actually thought of living a different kind of life, a more meaningful life. And I will be forever grat grateful and thankful to them. Thank you for listening to my story. I'm still not sure if I'll share it, but if I do, thank you so much. And thank you, Yunus and Qasim wherever you are. I'm, I hope you've had happy lives and may you live long and live happy lives. Bye.